Chapter 21 of Kabumpo and Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kabumpo and Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 21 How It All Came About. Before Pampa had time to rise, a tall, richly clad old nobleman rushed into the room. Peg! cried the old gentleman, clasping the princess in his arms. You are back. At last the enchantment is broken. For a moment the two forgot all about Pampa and the others. Then, gently disengaging herself, Peg seized the prince's hand and drew him to his feet. Uncle, she said breathlessly, holding to Pampa with one hand and waving with the other at Kabumpo and Wag. Here are the friends responsible for my release. This is my Uncle Tazifog, she explained quickly. And impossibly, Uncle Tazifog sprang to his feet and embraced each in turn, even Kabumpo. Sit down, begged the old nobleman, sinking into a golden chair and mopping his head with a flowered silk kerchief. Pampa, who could not take his eyes from his new and wonderful pig Amy, dropped into another chair. Kabumpo leaned limply against a pillar, and Wag sat where he was, his nose twitching faster than ever, and his ears stuck out straight behind him. "'You are probably wondering about the change in Peg,' began Uncle Tazifog, as the princess perched on the arm of his chair. "'So I'll try to tell my part of the story. Three years ago an ugly old peddler climbed the path to Sun Top Mountain. He said his name was Gleg, and, forcing his way into the castle, he demanded the hand of my niece in marriage. Peg shuddered, and Uncle Tuzzyfog blew his nose violently at the distressing memory. Then, speaking rapidly and pausing every few minutes to appeal to the princess, he continued the story of Peg's enchantment. Naturally, the old peddler had been refused and thrown out of the castle. That night, as Uncle Tuzzyfog prepared to carve the royal roast, there came an explosion. And when the courtiers had picked themselves up, Peg Amy was nowhere to be seen, and only a threatening scroll remained to explain the mystery. Gleg, who is really a powerful magician, infuriated by Uncle Tazifog's treatment, had changed the little princess into a tree. Know ye, began the scroll, quite like the one that had spoiled Pompa's birthday. Know ye that unless ye, princess of Sun Top Mountain, consents to wed J. Gleg, she shall remain a tree forever, or until two shall call and believe her to be a princess. The whole castle had been plunged into utmost gloom by this terrible happening, for Peg was the kindliest, best-loved little princess any kingdom could wish for. Lord Tuzzyfog and nearly all the courtiers set out at once to search for the little tree, and for two years they wandered over Oz, addressing every hopeful tree as princess but never happening on the right one. Finally they returned in despair, and Sun Top Mountain, once the most cheerful kingdom in all Oz, had become the gloomiest. There was no singing, nor dancing, no happiness of any kind. Even the flowers had drooped in the absence of their little mistress. Why didn't you appeal to Ozma? demanded Pompa at this point in the story. Because in another scroll, Gleg warned us that the day we told Ozma, Peg Amy would cease to even be a tree, explained Uncle Tazifog hoarsely. Then how did she become a doll? Tell me that, Uncle Fozzytog, gulped Wag, raising one paw. She'll have to tell you that herself, confessed Peg's uncle, for that's all of the story I know. So here Peg took up the story herself. The morning after her transformation into a tree, Gleg had appeared and asked her again to marry him. I was a little yellow tree, in the Winky country, not far from the Emerald City, explained Peg, and every day for two months Gleg appeared and gave me the power of speech long enough to answer his question, and each time he asked me to marry him, but I always said no. The princess shook her yellow curls briskly. One afternoon there came a one-legged sailor man and a little girl. Even Kabumpo shuddered as Peg Amy told how Captain Bill had cut down the little tree pared off all the branches, and carved from the trunk a small wooden doll for Trot. It didn't hurt, 
Princess Peg hastened to explain as she caught Pompa's sorrowful expression. And being a doll was a lot better than being a tree. I could not move or speak, but I knew what was going on, and life in Ozma's palace was cheerful and interesting. Only, of course, I longed to tell Ozma or Trot of my enchantment. I miss dear Uncle Tuzzyfog and all the people of Suntop Mountain. Then, as you all know, I was stolen by the old gnome, and after Ruggedo carried me underground, I forgot all about being a princess and remembered nothing of this. Peg glanced lovingly around the room. I only felt that I had been alive before. So you, Peg jumped up and flung one arm around Wag. And you, she flung the other around Pompa. Saved me by calling me a princess and really believing I was one. And you, Peg hastened over to Kabumpo, who was rolling his eyes sadly. You are the darlingest old elephant in Oz. See, I still have the necklace and bracelet. And sure enough, on Peg's round arm and white neck gleamed the jewels the elegant elephant had generously given when he thought her only a funny wooden doll. Oh, groaned Kabumpo. Why didn't I let you look in the mirror before? No wonder you kept remembering things. But why did Glegg send the threatening scroll to Pumperdink three years after he'd enchanted Peg? asked Wag, scratching his head. Because, shrilled a piercing voice, and in through the window bounded a perfectly dreadful old man. It was Glegg himself. Because, screeched the wicked magician, advancing toward the little party with crooked finger. When that meddling old sailor touched Peg with his knife, I lost all power over her. Because my question box told me that Pompadour of Pumberdink could bring about her disenchantment, and he has. I made it interesting for you, didn't I? There isn't another magician in Oz can put scrolls up in cakes and roasts like I can, nor mix magic like mine, ha ha. Gleg threw back his head and rocked with enjoyment. You have had all the trouble, and I shall have all the reward. Everyone was so stunned by this terrible interruption that no one made a move as Gleg sprang toward Peg Amy. But before he had reached the princess, there was a queer, sulfurous explosion, and the magician disappeared in a cloud of green smoke. They rubbed their eyes, and as the smoke cleared, they saw Trot, the little girl who had played with Peg Amy when she was a wooden doll. Ozma explained Trot breathlessly, for she had come on a fast wish. After following the adventures of Pompa and Peg in the magic mirror, as the magician had tried to snatch the princess, Ozma had transported him by means of her magic belt to the Emerald City, and sent Trot to bring her best wishes to the whole party. I'm sorry I didn't make you a prettier dress when you were my doll, said Trot, seizing Peg Amy's hand impulsively. But you see, I didn't know you were a princess. But you guessed my name, said Peg softly. There were so many explanations to be made, and so many things to wonder over and exclaim about, that seemed as if they would never stop talking. Uncle Tozzyfog rang all the bells in the castle tower, and stepping out on a balcony, told the people of Suntop Mountain of the return of Princess Peg Amy. Then the servants were summoned, and such a feast as only an Oz cook can prepare was started in the castle kitchen. The courtiers came hurrying back, for during Peg's absence, Uncle Tozzyfog had lived alone in the castle. Yes, the courtiers came back, and the people of Suntop Mountain poured in the castle in throngs, and nearly overwhelmed the rescuers by the enthusiasm of their thanks. Kabumpo had never been so admired and complimented in his whole elegant life. As for Wag, his speech grew more mixed up every minute. At last, when the courtiers and Uncle Tazifog had run off to dress for the grand banquet, and after Trot had been magically recalled by Ozma to the Emerald City, the four who had gone through so many adventures together were left alone. Well, how about Pumperdink, my boy, chuckled Kabumpo with a wave of his trunk. Are we going to let the old kingdom disappear or not? It is my duty to save my country, said Pompa loftily. Then with a mischievous smile of Peg Amy, Don't you think so, princess? Peg Amy looked merrily at the elegant elephant and then took Pompa's hand. Yes, I do, said the princess of Suntop Mountain. Then, you will marry me? asked Pompa, 
looking every inch a prince in spite of his singed head and torn clothes. We must save Pumperdink, you know, sighed Peg softly. Three cheers for the princess of Pumperdink! May she be as happy as the day is short, cried Wag in his impulsive way. Uncle Tuzzyfog was as pleased as Wag when he heard the news, and Pompa, attired in a royal gold-embroidered robe, was married to Peg Amy upon the spot with much pomp and magnificence. Never before was there such a rejoicing, a merrier company, or a happier bride. Kabumpo, arrayed in two gold curtains borrowed for the happy occasion, had never appeared more elegant, and Wag was everywhere at once and simply overwhelmed with attention. That same night a messenger was dispatched to Pumperding to carry the good news, and the next morning Pompa and Peg set out for the Emerald City, the princess riding proudly on Wag and Pompadour on Kabumpo. Knowing the whole four as you now do, you will believe me when I say that their journey was the merriest and most delightful ever recorded in the merry kingdom of Oz. After a short visit with Ozma and another to the king and queen of Pumperdink, they all returned to Suntop Mountain, where they are living happily at this very minute. End of chapter 21